I gotta turn the mic on. Well, let's talk about water. <clears throat> you know, sometimes when you go out to our mines, it's never a good idea to go to your mine and move your equipment out there and all your people and stare at water. Right? It's a little bit late in the game. So really, when you're talking about water and managing water, you need to know what that pit, what that mine is capable of, <clears throat> what worst case scenario is, so you can budget accordingly. You can budget man hours accordingly, pumps that need to be out there. If you don't have enough pumps, you may have to rent one. <clears throat> God forbid, but sometimes we do. Uh, but when we're doing that, we need to know how much water we're dealing with, right? So in this case, this was an Alabama uh, sump that's out there. So and it was in a kind of an irregular shape, you know, it wasn't just completely round, it was kind of weird shape. So Richard got this thing on uh, CAD and he just did an outline of it and calculated the surface area for me. But most of the time, I mean, it's not real hard, even if you got a round one, you can kind of figure out the length of it, the width of it. So let's talk about water. How, we want to know how much water is in this thing. <clears throat> We know it's got 21.5 million gallons of water in it. That's a lot of water. Not really that deep, but it was big. Well, how'd we get that? <clears throat> Went to the surface area. I asked Richard, what was the surface area on this thing? 478,882, Juan. There's a key number for you right there. Are you, get, get ready, okay, because we're going to burn that calculator up. <clears throat> then we went to the average depth. You need to know how deep that water is, right? Well, if you mined it and you left it, you already know where the floor is at. So when you got water that's up here, you're going to have a very, very good idea how much depth is of water is out there. I'm going to assume that. Except for Mr. Tuggle. Sometimes it just fills up and who the world knows, right? But really, there's a way to calculate that, and if you know where you were and you know where it is, you can figure it out pretty good. <clears throat> <clears throat> we know this number is a constant, 7.4805. That's your magic number. That's how many gallons per cubic foot of water there are. <clears throat> okay? So if we got these three, we can calculate it. So we're going to take that surface area and we're going to multiply it times the depth. And we're going to multiply that times the water volume. That's going to give you your total gallon. So it's in your book. Okay? So I want you all, all to have that calculation because many times <clears throat> you come up to someone and say, you may walk up to uh, Clint and say, Clint, how much water is in that thing? You know, because you need to know. You know, you got a budget. How long is the pump going to be there, etc.? He's going to be able to go out there and calculate that thing up for you and figure it out, okay? So that, that to me, is, is a big part of water management, and we'll get into outfalls and things like that in just a second. Let's go to uh, minimum mining standards. <coughs> there. It's right here. One more, right there. Okay, I'm just going to kind of hit the high points because if I read this whole thing, it, we'd all be asleep. But there's a lot of good information in a minimum mining standard. Is there, well I'm going to hit enough, okay? But is there anybody in here that's never seen minimum mining standards before? Matt, you don't count. Well, you do count. you never seen it? Okay. We keep this on the U-Drive, right, Richard? It's on... Uh... Sure. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll tell you what. If anybody needs a copy of it, send your book. <laughs> All right? So the minimum mining standards, this thing was written back in 2003. Uh, Mike Vickers uh, did this thing. It was in conjunction with several people before he finally came out with the final version. There are a few things in here that could be revised, and we're kind of working on that. I'm not saying the man was wrong, it's just some of the language we use now is a little bit different and a method or two, okay? But just getting to the beginning of it, the preliminary planning and testing, 
It's going to hit a few high points here on the basic grid maps. Basically, that's a one inch to 200 foot grid map. Everybody know what a grid map is? Why do we do it in 200 foot increments? Say again? Well, that's true. But when you're calculating something, it's a basic acre. An acre is 208 by 208, right? So it's a rough acre, okay? <clears throat> so that's how the thing was, was put together. So it's a basic map that shows the boundaries and the lines, major roads, easements right away, and major buildings, okay? So then you can kind of scroll down a little bit, but we're going to do the legal map. That's if you can get your hands on it. It's always good to have the legal. It's got the meets and bounds on it. And there may be things that, I mean, sometimes we found legal maps in the weirdest places. You might have one when they can't find it in Fort Worth, you know. In fact, by the way, Grace and Gum, gone. Monday was his last day. I don't know what they're doing to replace Grayson and who we're supposed to talk to about the legal side of things, but we'll find out. Well, until further notice, I guess, right? <clears throat> yeah. He's going to love that. <laughs> And so am I. So, pardon? What his email said to I think it said contact Dean. Dean Grant? Yeah, it did. Well, she's who I've been calling. Yeah. Okay. She, pardon? She had somebody ask me earlier this week. Mr. Grant. Mr. Grant. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't going to tell her that. So. <laughs> she's good, though. She answers the phone when nobody else will. Okay, uh, topo maps. This this is all part of your books too. You know, think about your mind planning books. Uh, you need a good topo map in there, and like Richard was saying, we can generate, we can get those things uh, pretty quick. Print you some out and get them to you pretty fast. Okay. Uh, that shows regional drainage. You know, there are times we want to see major aquifers that are near what we're doing, and uh, we need to know about that. And it also can show you, uh, right there under that it says alternate pit discharge points. We use the word uh, drainage and outflows now. <laughs> we don't use the word discharge anymore. So I got corrected on that. The drill map, number four there, uh, that's pretty self-explanatory. That's generally furnished to our drillers. You know, we want these guys to know where they're going when they're out there. And when they're through, we want you to know where they've been. Uh, mine plan maps, uh, that's kind of self-explanatory too. You know, if we shoot in your, your mine, <coughs> and you know how many cubic yards of material that your plant requires on an annual basis, you should be able to calculate it out according to the thickness, <coughs> what you're going to do. And I think I got a BOE back of the envelope uh, in your book. Eventually, look in the very back of that and see if there's a... No, right here. Sorry. Lego, Lego. No. Okay, well, it's in there somewhere. We'll get to it. <clears throat> On down, we've got an explanation of the grid map. Here, also, yearly update the mining plan as mandatory. And the responsibility of that is the regional production managers. They want to make sure that you have a mining plan in place. So it's your job to help them have that in place. I would say do it, have them approve it, and move forward. Number six, let's see, I didn't say anything about easement maps. Richard's already talked about that pretty good. Number seven on the air photo thing, uh, we don't really pay for that anymore because we can get them according to how close in you want to get on the, on the map. But uh, here we're talking about Mark the depth of the line. Oh, yeah. Um, surface feature details for grid maps. Co coordinate the air photos with the manager of exploration. So in other words, if you just need something, uh, as far as an uh, air photo goes, let me know. I meant to back up on the easement map. Remember we were talking about marking the depth of the utility lines when you cross them? That's a good idea. Mark that on your map. You know, we went out to Texas Clay there after our little incident, and we, we found everything. We had probes and all kind of stuff to find it, and then we had a sign we stuck there. I don't know if they're still there, but <clears throat> we knew exactly how deep those things were. 
Oh, is it? Did the tornado get it or did we rip it out? Yeah? Okay, going on down to the drill plan. Uh, I'm not going to get into that too much. Uh, but I did say... See the drill request. Okay, right here, Jim, on your computer. If you'll go to the stick. Look on uh, drill request form. I like that. This is what I want to show y'all. Has everybody in here seen one of these? Anybody seen one of these? Okay. <laughs> everybody that sends them out has seen them. So, okay. Well, we send this thing out annually. Uh, generally, late August. Uh, we'll send this thing out because we got to do a budget too. You know, just like you guys and everybody else. So, we need to plan ahead on what kind of drilling that you need and where you need it. This is just a, an example that's put up there, but you know, we break this thing down into uh, production drilling, mine planning, and expiration. We know, you don't really know how many expiration holes that you need. <laughs> but we do know that if we need to look outside of a property, just in case, like in Kansas, we were looking at extending a property up there one time, we needed to see what was around the perimeter of it, so we added a few there. But if you need some drilling in your area, look at your grid maps. Say, you know, I really need to work in this direction, like in Athens, over by that school road and, and the Denton Williamson pit, what we call it. And you guys want to know what's Robinson Road, what's, what's between Robinson Road and the pit. So we went in there and looked at a grid map and came up with how many holes that we needed. Okay? So we need this every year. We send this to uh, the regional managers and the plant managers. Uh, and then they generally get with the mining groups to find out how much drilling that we need. Jim, can you go ahead and take it back to the minimum mining standards? Okay, go to page five. Five? Yeah. There you go. Okay, this is a this is a great sentence. To determine, well, oh, I'm sorry, um, is that page five? All right, back it up one. That, for some reason, that's not looking the same as what I got in my book. Okay, hold that, hold that right there. Raw material evaluation. That's what I'm looking for. Keep going. Do we have more than one page five? Okay, well, whatever the page number is, don't worry about it. <laughs> okay? Raw material evaluation. Great sentence. The objective is to determine the important facts about each recognizable variable so that the best possible blend of material can be put together for the sole purpose of maximizing the quality product, uniformity of the mix, and the life of the pit. The life of mine. That's basically your base body program and making sure that it's repeatable and realistic. I mean, it's one thing to do a program and say, well, if we do it this way, the quality will work, but is it physically possible? I mean, we have gone in before and said we could do something that we really couldn't do. So you really need to look ahead and make sure that you got the right equipment, the right people, the right time allotted for it to get that done. <clears throat> Just to go on down to notes in the middle of this page. Obtain in-house or outside an in-depth geological report on each deposit including a review of possible contaminants such as lime, pyrite, etc. Again, the XRF machine is really going to help us with this because we're not talking about just identifying iron. How many minerals can we identify with this thing? Anything above what? Uh, I don't remember the number. The, the high metals on the periodic chart it won't do, but pretty much anything below that. I don't remember below, the exact number. It won't do carbon. <coughs> yeah. What's carbon? Number six? Yeah. Single digit. Do below. Yeah. Single digit. 
or the real high ones, which we don't care about. But it'll do all the most. The only the one we wish it could do is carbon, which it can't, right? But everything we make brick out of pretty much. Yes. All except for the trace elements and metals and that with it don't really have any effect on the final product anyway. Well, this has been in the minimum mining standards all along, but that's because this in-house was really outside testing. <laughs> You know, the XRD has always been outside testing. Or XRF, I'm sorry. So, well, that's true. That's true. So, so now we're going to be able to do a lot of this in house. We'll probably do some outside testing too for comparison purposes. But anyway, just to let you know. Let's move on down a little bit to number three right there. Uh, the summary on uh, test body additives. We're talking about sands. I don't think we use sawdust anymore, but we used to. Lignite, coal, calcine, uh, and all these things in percentages. So in other words, anything that's added to the base body program should come from your regional manager. That's not our decision. Okay, Our decision is to go and mine raw materials. Any addition that's put to it needs to come from the regional manager or plant, and plant manager. Okay, We'll let them worry about that. Uh, the B and the B there, test for uniformity. Here we're talking about a good old fashioned PSE. David, I believe over in your mining, you're actually doing a lot of your own PSEs, are you not? Okay, so you, you set up set up a little lab and you, I know you were doing quite a bit on the Daniels property, right? You did? Are you still doing that stuff? Okay. If there's any well, that's good. As long as you're following the ASTM standards of doing that testing, that's great. On the Daniels, some of the buff is better, <coughs> fatter than the white clay. Right. But it's heavy for me. Yeah. Well, that's your problem. <laughs> okay. Uh, so what we're seeing... Huh? Well, we do, we'll probably buy in there again, though, right? At least not for now. Okay. Okay, so what we were talking about on the test for uniformity, you know, the PSE values plus the visual color variations. I mean, that's critical. Because what we, what we might consider a white burning clay right here might be an off-white burning clay over here. That could make a big difference. The fatter that white clay or the kaolin clays is, the more powerful the coloring power is to it. That's just a given. It was the same way in the buff, you know, what I just showed you on that Alabama stuff on the table. Okay, let's go on down to production fact sheet. Does anybody want to add anything to this yet? Well, that's true. Did y'all hear that? What was the question? Oh, that's what I thought. <laughs> All outside task testing is to be routed through this lab. Yes, that would be preferable. Well, there's money involved there. Yeah. See? Okay. But plus, we need to handle the results right. So, okay. Uh, production fact sheets. This is this is pretty good actually. The objective is to define the overall production goal. In mining, it's supposed to be terms, not terms. <laughs> And to break the goal down into measurements of production that the first line supervisor as well as the operator can understand. Let's not make let's not make it so difficult people don't know what the hell they're reading, you know. Let's break it down into into some manageable methods. What I did on number one, uh, the annual estimate of yards to be stripped and mined. That's a given, right? Number two, this is this is a budget issue. Uh, what equipment will be used? I mean, just about all of these are budget issues. Number three, statement of number of people required. You know, that's a budget budget issue. 
Number four, the calculated yardage reserves. That's an expiration issue. Okay. Uh, number five, show the major mobile maintenance program and how it fits uh, into the overall timetable budget issue. Miscellaneous, uh, number six, the statement of plans to consider t timber and other resources before stripping has begun. A lot of times we'll have a timber company come in there if we're going to mine something, let them log it, sell, sell, sell it, make some money on it. We don't have to always knock it down and burn it or bury it, which we try not to do. huh? Yeah, I know. That's what they say. Uh, going down a little bit, mining production plan. <coughs> well, that's true. Uh, the mining, talking about the mining plan, um, to the objective is to describe in sufficient detail the mining, mixing operation required assured a reasonable uniform raw material to the plant. Uh, that's pretty self-explanatory. Well, I, I kind of dropped on down to number three there. Describe the mixing or blending methods of material. Why? When you're over in your tan pit, since I'm pretty familiar with your tan pit, as you're mining along in a thousand feet, one thousand feet, you have three changes in that material. Four. Well, how are you going to blend that on one layer and make it uniform? How do you do it? How do we do that? I asked you first. <laughs> Answer is you're going to have to start mixing. <coughs> how do you mix it? Uh, don't put it in different spots of the spot pile. Okay. How do you go about that? Dump one load here and one load there. And no, no, no. You got one row going this way, uh -huh. then you turn the trucks, the another one coming another way on a different row. Right. But you don't, you don't, you don't go, if you got different materials, you just don't go straight on that row. You got to start mixing it. So because if you start mixing, you start throwing a row of one same material, you're going to run out, and then you're going to have a different mixture. So well, you have to run this way and this way, so you run out and you start on the other one, you start mixing it together. Okay, well let's just say you got a plan to mix it for that layer. But what I will say is this, you got so many changes in that layer that if you simply change directions on the rows that you're doing, you're already blending it. Right, but if you don't have to dot here, dot there. You're already blending it because of the sheer fact that you had four changes in that, in that cut. Does that make sense? So if you're putting it in a different place on there, you're already blending it and you're doing everything you can to give the plant the best possibility of well, uniformity. Just because we do that doesn't mean it's still right. Because I didn't say it'd be perfect, but you got another layer, yeah. and another layer, and another layer. When we finish the stock the, the loader operator, the ones take it to the grinding or whatever, they have to still keep mixing that to get the right plant. I know that, but you're, you're stealing my thunder, mm -hmm. because what's happening is I'm talking about building a stockpile, mm -hmm. okay? So as you're building it, and as you have multiple changes in one cut, you also got multiple changes going down, don't you? So see, if you all of a sudden start a cut and you go all the way along and you just stop and then you go get something else to finish that layer, you just put two different <laughs> forms of material on there. What you want to do is finish that layer all the way across despite everything. Right. <clears throat> In fact, I'll tell you one thing, when we start the tan mining down there, that sandier bench you got, we're going to start with that. You know why? Richard said use it. Okay. Yep. No. <laughs> you can run. No. <laughs> you know, uh, well, believe it or not, believe it or not, it was discussed. <laughs> but with the sheer, uh, what the average annual rainfall down in Elgin? 35 uh, I'd say that's a minimum, wouldn't it? That's about right. Okay, 35 inches. In Alabama, it's 55 inches. What is it in, uh, in your area? 17. 17, you liar. That's East Texas. <laughs> God's country. I think we've had that last month. Yeah. Oh, I, I meant for the year, not the month. So. All right. We had over three. 
Well, that's the thing. I mean, it's not just the material that's going to dictate your equipment. But it's going to be what are your conditions, right? So, there you go. Where did I leave off? All right, let's go to four. Describe moisture variation problems and methods to minimize. What are we talking about here? We're talking about bank moisture, right? <clears throat> not what's coming down. But on the bank moisture, what what's the bank moisture coming out of the buff pit right now? I'm picking on you today. Well, out of the buff pit is coming out like at between 16 and 18 percent. That's correct. That's right. 16 and 18 percent. So you got to knock that moisture down to something below 12, right? Well, on a good hot day. Sorry. We went down on the moisture below 11. Okay then, I stand correct. Right, so now we're going to go to 11. Well, that's fine. But I said below 12, so I was close. All right. Yes, <clears throat> so with that amount of moisture that you have in there, that's pretty wet. When you get that on your stockpile, what are you doing with it? Are you just piling it up and letting it sun all day? Or? Sorry. We lay out a foot at a time later. One foot thickness. Okay. Then uh, we rip it and then uh, we disc it and disc it with uh, Okay, you're disking it. So we got a disc down there over at Elgin. Not everybody uses them, but we do. We have to. Because we got so much ground moisture coming out, James Tuggle, that it's not like, well, I don't know, some of that yellow you get over there can have some pretty good moisture too. Like yes, yeah, nothing like that. Well, it's it's a dog, you know, so even if you got a perfect weather in your stockpiling, you still can't just hurry it because you got to get that moisture level down to a manageable level, you know? Number five. Uh, how about build two stockpiles? We do that. We build two stockpiles. Uh, while we're working one and getting the moisture content down on it, we're laying a stockpile on another one. You know, many times we've done that. Show plan for regularly verifying actual work face conditions to the drill log information. Show a plan for regularly verifying actual working face conditions to drill log information. <clears throat> what does that mean, David? Well, that's right. Well, that driller over there is describing that material on that log. <clears throat> Richard is showing you fired results, you know, of cross sections. You get to go over to the exposure that you have and verify that. Right? I will tell you when I did the mining at the Dixie plant, <clears throat> when it was running, I lived and died on isopax. Because the ground moisture over there was 22 and 26 percent. You could almost squeeze water out of that clay that came out of the ground. So we had to depend almost 100 percent on how thick a given layer of material was. And it was perfect. Worked out just right. Number six. <laughs> it was perfect. <laughs> no, it, when I say it was perfect, it was too. Because, especially on that red red side, <clears throat> over by the the sweet gum tree, perfect. Over by the monkey house. Didn't stick to the truck was all right. Regional manager actually reviews reserves for the respect respective plant and provide information to Acme Brick Technical Center in January of each year for publication in the annual clay reserve report. Well I didn't know that. <laughs> well number six. See right there the regional manager annually reviews the reserves for their prospective plant and provide information to Acme Bricks Technical Center. Well He's actually now reviewing it with us, okay? So this is a little outdated because the plant, really How does it really work? the plants were doing their own reserves and now we're doing their reserves. How does it actually work? Because we're updating their reserves. I got another form on there. Just a 
I mean, the usage. Huh? Well, the usage is a big deal to us. It's not just what you're pulling out of the hole. Look under. Uh, um, Reserves. No. I had a sheet that uh, thought I. Raw material. No, that's not it. Um. Never mind. Go to my my computer. Where? Where? The top one, almost top. Oh. Let's see. Copy quality workshop. No. No. I don't know where I put it. Nope. All right. Well, anyway, <coughs> it's all right. Well, we do send out David. You know, every year to to the regional managers and the plant managers, how much raw material is used on an annual basis. We also want to know the blend and all this other stuff. So, when they send us these uh, numbers, it sometimes it jives really good, right, Richard? <laughs> and sometimes it don't, because if they only made so much brick, and their mix is whatever percentage they send us, then they can't. You know, if they're used, they're supposed to be using this much material and they say they're using this much, we do the math. We'll find out. Because once we come in there with a reserve, we want to be able to hang our hat on it. <clears throat> if we go a really long time before going in there to do more work to prove these reserves, we may have to go back out and do a new drill project. You know, in other words, sometimes uh, we've been handed a reserve that we haven't really proven ourselves. And we don't have many of them left, do we, Richard? We got a few, but not many. Yeah. <clears throat> but whatever the plant uses per year, that's what we're taking off of the reserves. Because even though you've mined it and stockpiled it, it's still unused material and it's still part of the reserves. Okay? Surface drainage plan. I only hit a couple of points here. It says um, the objective to effectively and efficiently dispose of water without undue clay contamination or loss of production to meet all state and federal regulations and to be a good neighbor. This is basically just manage your water properly, right? I jumped down to locate a permanent sump. I thought that was a, a good idea. Some properties we can do that. We can put a permanent two-stage settling tank out there right somewhere near our outfall and it works great as we mine along and as we go. Some places it's a traveling sump because that might not be your outfall as in the case of tan and, and buff. Uh, obtain your average rain and snowfall. Okay, Determine total water to be handled. We've talked about how to calculate that. <clears throat> then uh, came on down to show the mining plan. It says the drainage plan, but basically on your mine plan you need to mark your outfalls. Okay, because whatever water is happening on your property needs to wind up at that out the proper outfall. You don't want to redirect water to go off of your property somewhere it's not supposed to. That can create a lot of attention. Right? You ain't never done that. <clears throat> It is a big thing, uh, especially because we deal, like in East Texas, with a lot of major tributaries, and they're expecting that water to go in one direction. So we don't need the water going in a different direction. Like, say, they got a big shopping mall putting in, all of a sudden they got mud holes showing up in places they've never had water before. Well, they get in trouble over that too. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Okay. Describe in detail all governmental, wait a minute, uh, any or all governmental restrictions or self-imposed restrictions placed on water leaving property and how each above is supposed to handle it. Okay, go to C, mining reclamation. I just kind of went straight for the note um, under it. For this section of the state which condi uh which condition the pit meets and date when it will 
conform to minimum standards. So I guess, Rob, I guess that's uh, something we're talking about. Like for you guys, you have, you don't have a date on when you're supposed to finish your reclamation, but you do have conditions on what's supposed to happen for that reclamation. In fact, Richard sent you something yesterday, I think, to get it. Okay, we'll keep going. And I'm just going to kind of wrap mine up, I think. I'm going to hit the this page here to me. And there's a little bit more beyond it. But uh, mining plan, minimum standards, and checklist. An internal audit form. These are 12 items on here. If you hit all 12 of these items, you should be able to put together your mining plan, current, and five-year mining plan. Anybody agree or disagree with that? Remember the air photo? We can handle that stuff now. But you know, really, this, this is a good checklist because um, it also helps you to realize what you're lacking in your mining books. And remember, that mining book's just going to keep growing. Okay. Any questions on minimum mining standards or any comments? Now where yeah. Oops, oops. <laughs> okay. This made me too tired to do this. Too tired to do it. <laughs> well it is a lot of information. So all right, well thank you very much. All right, how many of you have stockpile here? I'm guessing everybody. <laughs> I'm guessing everybody. Oh you match you lie. <laughs> all right. But you do get our stockpiles that we drill afterwards and uh do play quite a role in our stockpile. As a matter of fact, proving them before we do, huh? Uh huh? Now you're lying. Talk to me like you're in my office. Oh, okay. <laughs> Definition of stockpile: an accumulation of mine material which provides a steady source of supply for the manufacturing of a plant. And I actually looked that up to see if it's right, and it does say for future use and other la la la. But I think we kind of cutting it down. And stockpile is not just an earth moving exercise. Quality reserves are, are required. Uh, and, you know, Matt will tell you, wh why do we require quality results? <laughs> I, I, come on, man. Come on, man. Customer wants. Okay. All them first pictures we looked at when we started this day, right. all them pictures and the oh, quality of cost and all that stuff and the cost of quality, that's why we need if we start right here, we get good quality stockpiles and the likelihood. I'm not saying stuff's not going to happen in the kilns periodically, but I promise you that every time they have an issue, they're going to come to raw material first. Yep. And if we follow our protocol, drill our stockpile, send them to Matt, and he'll get our information out there, they'll burn their bars and everything, it makes it really hard for them to say it's raw material because we've covered all of our bases. When we don't do that, it leaves you wide open. And they, they're they going to bust your ass for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's just the way it is. I mean, they're going to start there. You know, and you're literally going to be in the hot seat until they, until they work through the system. And more often than not, if you've done your due diligence on building stockpiles, it's not going to be raw material. I've, I've been there two or three different times with a couple of different stockpiles. And, you know, it's usually an air issue or a kiln issue or a lot of times. And we build combined stockpiles for, our, for Bennett out there. And the uh, loader operator makes a lot of difference on how that is handled, too. If you don't get the whole stockpile and get the whole layer, you don't get a good composite of the whole stockpile. And then you've got an issue with color or whatever. They're, they've got soluble sulfate issues out there. And if they don't get theirs, then they, they have big issues out there. And, and a lot of it would be a, just a loader operator. That's right. What about when that airplane is up? Well, then, you know, if you've got a three and a half foot layer of a certain material and, and he starts up there and he gets three and a half foot, you don't get that layer. And, and that, in their case, that affects them quite a bit. Uh, we don't necessarily build components now like we did. But that, that's a big, big issue. And, and I tell you, every plant I've been to and seen 
almost every loader operator does it. And you go out there and you can tell them to cut it down. They'll pile that stuff up. Then you got you, what you have is a, an unmixed bottom layer, three and a half foot, whatever it is. They load that on the trucks and go straight to the plant. Now, you, now you've got a pocket of something in your building yep. of, of a single material. So it, it's really important that they don't do that, but it, they do it everywhere we go. Every, we can go out there and we're like, God. I mean, I, I'm in a mine right now where I've got about three foot of material. It, it's just one material, which makes my job easier. I build a 16 foot stockpile means I only have to do 14 or 13 or whatever. But you can't build a quality stockpile unless you understand your reserves. And that, you know, Bob just had went over that, all that and the importance of knowing your reserves. <coughs> all right, the advantages of stockpiling can be constructed during favorable weather. Is that an advantage? <laughs> Is that an advantage? Well, we'll <laughs> I mean, what if it rains? <laughs> yeah, I was like, what if it rains? I mean, I mean, ra rain has been tearing us up quite a bit. So, and we probably got 17 inches last month. I don't know, we got a lot. We're still getting it. But uh, it controls the blending of components. And that's true. now. Just like I was talking about James and them, they do a 70-30 mix out there on their stockpiles. And sometimes the mining guys, they don't get dizzy. We, 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 them stockpiles out there are really nice. Ain't they, James? <laughs> You're sucking up now. <laughs> but now they are close. But uh, I have went to some where it's supposed to be three and a half, one and a half, or three and two. And they'll be closer to, they're nowhere near what they're supposed to be. So spacing is really important on them so you can control what goes in them. And just can be one material or a combination of many. Now, Bobby, when you were out here with us, we used to go to the garrison plant, which is now closed down. Yeah. And that, that was a really big obstacle for us because it wasn't so many materials it was just it was so sandy that we literally built them stockpiles a foot at a time like you do sometimes and we had to drill and test them we had woody there that done pscs on them just for, for make sure we had enough clay content because they had very little clay and very little places to go get it and you had one hole back there that was really depleting out fast yeah and that that was the high side. Well, you know, <laughs> that, that that and you had to really struggle to get that in there because more often than not you, we, we couldn't get the clay. We had a pocket, like I said, back on the back of the fly property, and it was good fat clay. But we, we would have to high grade it constantly, you know, with the next lift. But we had to really watch it. But they, that plant was really good about getting the the PSE test done, and getting back to us usually the same day. All right, contaminants can be excluded. This is true. I've got a pit now. Right now, it's never had lime in it before that I know anything about, but we hit lime. Where? On the, moving north, up there behind the old barn. I mean, a big pocket. Hell of a lot of lime. Where? Jennings. Jennings. Oh. I mean, a lot of it. But it's all in overburden, overburden so there's none in the clay, but, but you know, but it, it's, it, that's rare. We haven't hit it in, anywhere else that I know of. Did you hit it when you was out there? I, I don't recall it. Uh, maybe the buried it in the bottom of the pit. Yeah. Yeah, that was sad. But the, and even then, you know, even the bottom of that pit, you know, we had carbon issues and we, we finally got away from it. We was having 75 25 mix out there just to control that, the carbon. So we, we kind of got away from that. And James and them, they're, they're mixed up. They have a little bit of carbon issue out there. And, and it can be tested and altered, which, like I said about Garrison, we tested every foot and we adjusted as we went. It it may kind of cumbersome and slow us down, but you know. All right, stockpiling furnishes greater consistency. Variation in materials can be accounted for. And most of my pits, I don't, I have pretty consistent mining. You know, I may have a little bit of variance in PSC some of them, but 
you know, we stay pretty well within the plant perimeters as far as that goes. But, you know, it, we don't have a lot of problems with that right there. Provides all weather access. Take work to get that far. Who in the hell put that on there? <laughs> <laughs> it's stockpiling nothing to do with access. <laughs> but anyway, if, if that, I don't know where he got. I, <laughs> when I when I looked at that, I'm like, well, I don't, okay, unless I build it out there at the plant. Well, I think what he's trying to say is you can tear the wet face off of it and get some usable material. Okay. <laughs> Okay, that's what I put in my notes. <laughs> that's what I put. Yeah, no, I put. That's what I put. That, and that's what, that is obviously what it meant because you can clean it up and put it out to the side, mixed in with the wet, the dry, and then send it on to the plant. And it's usable. But yeah, when I when I ran across that, I thought, man, <laughs> who done that? Oh, thin layers of grog can be included. That used to be pretty common. And, and who, I'm, who, doesn't somebody add sand? No, doesn't somebody common. add sand to a stockpile now? Huh? Didn't somebody in Acme put sand in the stockpile? A layer of sand? Yeah, we put it in the perla. The perla? Yeah. Okay. Huh? Okay. I, 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 I was thinking I heard somebody had to put sand in, in their, a layer of sand in there. I, I don't have that problem. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> I will say that too. Wine's got, got a good point. He puts uh Green waste out of the plant. In there. Get a big old pile of it, and he later stockpiles green waste. Is that the one that had the 12.5 moisture oil go? <laughs> 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 okay. I, I, I mean, I'm just, I'm just seeing how it works for you. It's just a typo. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I just, I, I happen well, to see that. <coughs> All right. Uh, disadvantage of stockpiling. The potential for wet weather because of increased exposure, or wet material because of increased exposure. Well, with the amount of rain we get, man. 17 inches? Yeah. Well, it's closer to 40. Yeah. <laughs> but potential wet material because of increased exposure. I, they, over there, they've been pretty good about getting it and with the exception of Daniels, it's a it's a pit that's high moisture coming out of the ground, but we we, we can use it. But that that's one of the, a big thing there. Is improper blending of components. If if the mining folks are watching what they're doing, that's probably rare, but it's possible it is a disadvantage. Like I said, well, go the biggest issue people are going to have is loader operators, and once it gets to the plant, yes. Improper blending of components. You wouldn't think that building a stockpile does, does anything but makes your material more uniform. No, you can put a stockpile. With and I say that because it's happening even now. So. That's why we're having this meeting. Well, if if you read them drill logs and color deals, I mean, most of it's on there. And PSC, you know, that's why we have them. But, uh, you know, and, and this is what I don't like about 200 foot centered on drilling. And we do it. I've always done it. But if you have any questions, I've, I've actually had drilling come back and do 100 foots because formation changes. And once you hit that spot and you know it, then you got to isolate it. And we've had to do that in several places. <coughs> Matter of fact, we did that down in uh, Garrison, and we we done it in a couple of other spots. But you know, oh, yeah. but it, when when drilling can get there and get that hundred foot stuff done, a lot can happen between the process of st beginning of stockpiling, the end of stockpiling, and then. You drill it at five foot, or I, I drill mine at five foot, ten foot, fifteen foot. So you can kind of catch it there, but for the most part, in 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 the drill logs, a lot of that stuff you won't catch because it, you know, it it'll, it'll be between that two hundred foot area, and and I, I've had that happen, and you know, even sand, you, you if you get a silty material, high silty material, and I did in, in one, and. <laughs> 
five foot, it just blow the stock pile out of hell. You know, but it looked all the same, good fat material. But so I mean, it it happens. Wrong materials. That can be done if you're not familiar with the pit. Be the only way I see that could happen. Uneven thickness of layers, that's what I was talking about earlier. Is some stockpile I've seen pictures of back when we used to have MSHA all together. We, I don't know whose mine it was. I think I do, but there was a really bad picture of a blended stockpile that was just all over the place. But actually, I do know who it was, and I know who, but I, I ain't going to say. But erosion of l loose material. And that right there is, is why the last stockpile built, we left burns up because hell it washes down it, it goes over the roads <coughs> it, it, it makes a, a mess going off the side and we're just thinking that's going to help run least run it off and the loader operator comes back he can clean it up and maybe mix it up if, or move it or something and cost of additional handling yeah years ago when before acme bought takes clay they mined it straight out of the pit they don't trucks with excavator they took it to the pit, built stockpiles at the plant. Mm -hmm. But Acme bought them and it stopped all that kind of. And we do now, now we do handle it differently. But the cost is, you know, you ain't got all the direct cost of hauling before you use it, I guess. But that's all I have on that. Do I? Yeah. Do I? Why you ask me that? Well, I'm just curious because some of the stuff that we're covering is a little bit older. Needs to be updated. I'm about to get into it. So, but it looks like it's broke, don't fit. What's my thing? I think there's more advantage to building a stockpile than not building one. Oh, I do I think the only plant I can think of weird where we went straight to the mine, dug it out of a hole, threw it straight in the grinding and make brick. Is that right? Well that's right, you're uh yeah, you're yeah. shale. But that yellow is pretty bad, I yeah. mean wet, isn't it? Is it wet? That yellow you got? Uh, we've got it in the stockpile, so the yellow we have in the stockpile so we're able to well, I'm basically continuing what David was talking about. Um, let's see, we're under stockpiling. Yeah, and I'm talking about uh, construction. Next to last. So really, see that goes from what David just had there, and just scroll down to the next page. Oh. And just I, I just kind of take it on down to 5.0. There you go. Stockpile construction. I just kind of cover some of these real quick. <clears throat> Basic rules is what we're talking about. The base must be smooth and level. Well, <clears throat> I don't know how many guys would want to put a stockpile on an uneven ground. I think the only thing that we really looked at at Elgin was toward the top, toward the barn. There's that one spot where it comes up and we can't dig there because there's a buried utility under it. So we ha <laughs> it actually kind of hampers us a little bit right th at the beginning of that pile. But other than that, we do pretty good there. What was that, Alan? What was all this? You got that going on? Not Over at Sealy? Not anymore. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's see the next one. Uh, the base should be a contrasting material so that the loader does not dig too deep. A lot of times we used to put brick bats down and then start stockpiling right on top of the brick bats 
So the front end loader operator knows where to stop. We were talking about airplaning a minute ago. Or getting to it. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you, uh, when you got three components in a lift, and that guy is coming up airplaning like that, and then the color's off in the plant, damn right they're going to blame raw material. So here we are busting our butts to build these stockpiles in a very technical way and quality way. We don't need somebody coming in behind us, you know, sabotaging the product, you know, accidentally or whatever it may be. Uh, avoid irregular shaped piles. I did that once over in Bennett. Didn't work out too well. But anyway. <laughs> well. <laughs> that or get the Ray Palmer pile that's 43 feet and whatever, you know. Okay. Um, what was that? Don't throw stones. <laughs> well, I threw one at me first, so I cast the first stone. Each layer must be the same thickness from end to end and side to side. Anybody agree with that? Kind of throws your percentages off if it doesn't, right? Uh, spread with a dozer, correct with a road grader. Well, we don't use a road grader as a dozer, by the way. So some people think we do, but we shouldn't. Cause it causes a lot of damage to those things. And use a post hole digger and a tape measure. Now that was the Mike Vickers way of doing things when you're doing a one foot, you know, one foot increment. And he was testing every foot. He got that from Dickie Clay when he worked for Dickie Clay, and they made sewer pipe. They were they had real tight tolerances that they were they were doing. I'm not saying you have to use a post hole digger, but the man wrote it, and I passed it on. If you want to use a post hole digger in that hard shell at Fort Smith in that gray band, you just knock yourself out. Okay, let's scroll on down, and we'll go to uh, 5.1.6, the top there. The working face must face the sun and into the predominant wind if possible. Everybody agree with that? <coughs> We've done, we've built a, well, you said always. I built, we used to build a stockpile in a hole in Garrison, Texas, behind the plant. And that was what they called a red tone stockpile. And when you build a pile down in a hole, it really don't matter which way the damn thing faces. <laughs> you know, I mean, there wasn't, there wasn't any prevailing winds down there, trust me, but. All we could really do at that point was just make sure the drainage was as good as possible. So, and I jumped down to five point. Huh? Yeah. Let's see. He said at five point two five here. Do not build a dome-shaped pile. It must be flat on top with a ramp at each end. Mike Bicker said that. Why do you think he said? Because he didn't want to see this because at the time he wrote it people were building this instead of just a slight crown in the middle they were really doing this and they were winding up throwing their percentages off and the, from a consistency and a percentage standpoint you get your percentages off way off yeah so it's it's almost like airplaning in reverse you know you're just messing yourself up when you're building it rather than when you're grabbing it. <laughs> well, that's possible. Nothing like thinking outside the box there. <laughs> well, here's an important one. 5.3.2.1. Where's that at? 5.3. Right there. The height of each bench is equal to or less than the reach of the equipment. Very good. <laughs> well, hey, well, if you've got a, a 650 excavator out there with a 19 foot reach, I don't know that we want to make a 19 foot cut. I really don't. We did that once at a 13 foot cut at Garrison, Texas, and what happened? Okay. Well, the the wall failed on it because we hit a real sandy spot in there, and the wall started to fail. The excavator's sitting right on it. You know, we got it out of there, but it was it was tricky. 
So a lot of times now what we're doing with Richard in our block mining is we're coming in with eight foot cuts most of the time. In fact, the eight foot cuts we're doing in Alabama is because it's a vertical formation. And when we dug the test hole over there just with an excavator to do the perimeter of the property, just that small cut we had was failing. Because I was kind of going, going as far down as that stick would go. The whole thing was failing. So we knew at that point we needed to make it eight feet because when you get your operator up in an articulated truck, he's going to be above what that fa failure is, you know. So it's got to be safe. What other reasons? I mean, there's other reasons to keep it a shorter cut. What other reasons can you think of? Long-term failure, right? Sloping, slumping. Erosion issues. Okay, I didn't really get too much further in my notes on this thing. Stockpile height, 5.4. He Rick Rickers wrote this. Use a hand level, use a surveying level, direct poles down both sides. Is everybody doing that? Y'all putting poles down the sides of your stockpiles and measuring them? <laughs> a lot of head shaking over here, KY. Mark the poles so that you know when to start the next layer and when to top out the pile. So if you're going to build a 16-foot pile, you can march, mark each lift on that thing. So that when you hit that lift, you know it's time to drill it. And it keep, gives your operator a pretty good target as he's going down to keep these ox bows out of the piles. Anything to add on that? You still marking your pile? Oh. Yeah. Let's see test procedures. We're going to get into that uh, quite a bit, but at the end of the day, make sure you're doing your drilling program and drill each lift. Right, Juan Herrera. Yeah. Regional drill rigs. We have that. Construct a map with hole locations, which we've already talked about. Plant test. That's one of the things. Um, well, at the end of the day, Jim, at Elgin, did they do a plant test before they started using the stockpile? Does everybody's plant do that? Okay. Denton does that quite a bit, don't they? I meant to... <laughs> Well, well, the reason I'm asking, in, in my past, we got to Garrison one time. You remember the time that plant manager there said he needed a ready pile? He said, we're ready to make brick out of it just as soon as you put it on the ground. And that's what we did, yeah. And that's what we did. We threw him up a 5,000 yard pile in a hurry. And it went straight to the plant, started making brick out of it because it was... <laughs> It was just a little miscalculation that had happened. You know, he was supposed to have three or four more months of material, and next thing we know, we get this emergency call. We're over there throwing material on the ground as fast as we can. But ordinarily, if it's not an emergency, we try to test these piles, make some brick out of them, make sure the thing's going to work the way it's supposed to. Matt does a lot of work with that on composite work with the uh, drill comps, make sure that stuff's acceptable, and I think it, many times you go through with the plant blend as well mm -hmm. to make sure that's going to happen. <clears throat> Let's see. I think the rest of this is pretty much something you guys already know. Nothing. Let's talk about recovering methods on 8.0. Well, I guess we're talking about the loader here. Work the face top to bottom, side to side. Uh, make numerous cuts, pile and mix before hauling. So at this point here, and I'm thinking about the tan material now that we're using at Elgin. We kind of started them doing that because for a long time that plant, they were just going in there, going from bottom to top, getting a, a load of it and taking off with it. Well, after we built this tan, we kind of changed some of that up because if they'd have done that, <laughs> they would have made a hell of a range of brick because in that thousand feet, there's four changes in there. So all we can do is blend it the best we can when we build it, but we leave it up to that loader operator to finish the job, right? 
slope drainage away from the face. That means when they when they do start airplaning, <laughs> well, they come in there and they have to fix that thing. That don't mean to make a hole, right? And keep loose material to a minimum. Clean up after each shift. A lot of times we do that. Sometimes we don't. Uh, I will say with the wet edges that we have on the stockpile, the plant at Elgin is doing a great job of working that stuff back in and they're drying it out and <clears throat> taking advantage of the good weather. So if you got wet material sitting on the ground and the sun shining, they need to be working it. Dry that material up and work it back into the face that you got. All right, David, you're next. Yeah, you got another one. All right, calculation duct pile to see percentages. Uh, does anybody build stock piles over 16 foot tall? You do? I yeah, top 18. 18? Yeah. Is that because of uh, thicknesses of lifts? You have to build them to well, get everything uh, in it? When, we, when I first started here, we, we used just strictly scrapers. Right. And we did uh, foot layers. And uh, what I was told was that uh, at the time we were using that L180. Yeah. Loader, and that's what it could, it could reach 18 foot, but that's what they went. Well, I think it's a good rule of thumb that everybody uses for building stock piles, whatever the loader reach. Yeah. You, you, you know, whatever ones you're doing the load out with, because you, you don't want to obviously make it where. Yeah, it's for me, the undercut Yeah. Back on <coughs> all right, well, most all mine are 16 foot, and somehow Bobby got this calculation good for us, but I don't build one, one foot uh, layers. But, you know, first off, you know, based on the loader, like I said, you need to figure out how high you're going to build your stockpiles, you know, and then determine the thickness of the layers. Actually, that's going to be based on your percentages down here. Uh, determine the number of layers needed to build the pile. You know, of course, if you build yours 18, yours is going to be different than mine 16. Yeah. Most, most of mine, I use five-foot lifts. Well, now that we're using trucks, we still go 18 foot, but now we're using trucks, we use two foot layers. See. Yeah. But, well, I, I'll build mine, and I'll drill them at five foot, and then 15, I'll put a cap on top of it, settle it in. We'll the same. same material. So, you know, it ends up being 16, but, you know. But, determine what percent of each material to be placed in the stockpile, which Bobby had this here. If, if you build that stockpile, you know, based on 16 foot, each layer is one foot, and each layer needs needed in the stockpile, 16 layers needed. Three types of material. <coughs> All righty then, you, you, that, forget that. There, there, there's your, there's your bill right there. Now, if you build a 20 foot one, <laughs> that's not going to work, but. Like I said, that that's works pretty good for me because most of mine are 16, but I don't have blended stockpiles anymore. So, and you do though, ain't yours? Your, your stockpile is blended, right? Are they what now? They're blended? Yeah. Don't You have multiple materials in there? Oh, yeah. But I, I think, doesn't one of your stockpiles, you, you bring material from another pit in them? In, in Here at the, at the Austin pit, we do what they call a new red pile. Uh -huh. And it's a mix of buff out of school and a mix of bread for the Hobson. And we do a, a 60-40. We do, uh, we go uh, Hobson soil, Hobson, Hobson soil. So when you do that, do you put it on stockpile with the Arctic trucks? Or no, you we, we, we stockpile here at the plant with, uh, with scrapers, uh -huh. degrees, and then we have the other stuff trucked in uh, by a contractor. And we just, this is the only stockpile here where I like to make a longer ramp you, when we make them for us, our trucks are getting under, we do steep. That way you don't have that much waste on, on the surface to cut them off. Right. But here at the plant, we do a longer slope so that the uh, road trucks can get up there and dump it so we don't have to double handle. That way we don't have to dump it on the ground and pick it up with a loader and, and take it back up there. So they, are they in dumps? Yeah. Really? All right. We, we used to do that. <laughs> <laughs> that proved not to be very wise for us down there. Well, sometimes you gotta sit up there and babysit. Yeah. They're dumping gets, gets off. So you gotta yeah. <laughs> well, 
<laughs> you know, this how you can't get out to the edge and get any compaction now. I, I can see where if they get too close, you turn yeah. the truck over too. But I mean, I, that scared me to death. But that actually happened down there for us. And shortly after that, we got away from that. Right about that time, wasn't it, Luke? We went to Pop Tails and Pulps. And I, th I think everybody and, and their kin folks were there that day. And, you know, <laughs> just everybody was like, oh. I think Jerry Hodge, everybody was there. But everybody. <laughs> but so David, one, one thing you, you mentioned, we, we use these sheets of picking our percentage and getting our lids in our layers when huh. we're doing layer piles. Do, do you take into account your highest plastic material to do your cap with, to cap it with, even if you have to flip two layers? That's a, a good idea because of the, of the compaction that you'll get up there, get, and for weather, all weather runoff and stuff like that. Uh, like I said, I, I don't have a lift problem. I, I, I guess I'm lucky out there. We used to have, but yeah, we we did used to cap with the higher or the better compaction material. But anybody got a question on stockpile estimation? That's a Okay, and please feel free to ask questions anytime during this. I'm just going to kind of go over, Bobby asked me to go over what all, all we've talked about so far is the work you guys do putting the stockpiles up, making sure the material's right, drilling them, and getting us the material. So then now I'm going to kind of go through what we do with the material once we receive it. Uh, we, we've all seen this... Um, Let's see if where's the little laser thing. In the middle. Ah, there we go. And Bobby talked about one with the line on the. This, the so obviously this form has been modified over the years by various regional people and all that. But this one does have a, a spot for the actual stockpile name on there. Um, so we saw this form before in a blank form. This is one that was filled out uh, like we like it. Uh, from a lab perspective, you can never have too much on here. Um, <laughs> and we, we, we want as much information as possible. So um, this is one that's done well. Of course, it's got the, in this case, you've got the 15 holes. It also talk, a little dis, dis, uh, talks about where they got the materials from. We were talking about blending um, different number of layers to make the drill. In this case, this is the second drill. Um, it has a height right here, so 11 and a half feet. So, really without a good proper map that just gets us off on the wrong foot. It's crucial for us to, to process everything correctly for us to have a good detailed map telling us exactly what you guys have drilled. Yes, Luke? Is this the, the standard form that everybody needs to be using? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. I want to make sure that's Yeah. I think this one has been, somebody probably put this as a, in a PDF or something where they were able to type in their stockpile name like that. But the one that Bobby showed before, which is basically this, is, is the one that we are all supposed to be using. I, I, yeah, I think there's a there's a blank somewhere in the in the Acme intranet world somewhere. Um, so so our, the complete data, of course, um, the holes, including the numbers. Um, I'm not going to go into because Bob, you know, I, I know that some people do. If they do three layers, they do one through fifteen, and then. 16 through 30. I, I'm not really concerned about that as long as you just give each each hole for each lift a number. I'm not too concerned if it's 1 through 15, 1 through 15, 1 through 15 because the way we do our data, it's always going to be put in also as what the height was or whether it was first or second drill. So we'll always be able to differentiate that. Um, yardage and lift descriptions. Um, put as much information as you can on there. The height and then of course the drill number and the date. Um, sample Go ahead. Now, 
is everybody using this form? Do you get some, some in that don't have this form with them? Yes. Okay. I mean, some people have taken and, and they've kind of turned this thing into an Excel spreadsheet. Um, I don't think anybody's here from Tulsa, are they? Good, so I'm not going to throw them out there. Oh, yeah. yeah. That, they're one, because they just recently did that. And, and it's fi it was fine because it did give us all the information, but they had, for whatever reason, whoever was doing it at some point had just developed an Excel spreadsheet that basically was this. But, um, yeah. I think that's fine. I'm going to say I don't care as long as we get all this information. It, it, it's great if you use this form. I mean, it's there. It's easy. If we get the same form for right. everybody all the time. But I'm not going to... Yeah, okay. Scratch what I just said. Use this form. <laughs> yes. Direction always needs to be on. Oh, yes, that, that as well. Um, and it is on here. And the dimensions as well. The length and width, and of course you have you already have your height on there. Yes. I saw just recently we've gotten some stockpiles in that don't have 15 holes. We got another one in that had like a lot more than that, didn't we? Give yes. Them? And is is there rhyme or reason to that, or is it they just? I know what that since my history here is basically each plant kind of has their their own thing, and I know sometimes it's based on size. Yeah. Well, it should be based holes. on size. So. But. It, it, Jim's right. I mean, sometimes like the peacock. No one here from Birmingham, so I'm not going to get anybody upset. You know, for whatever reason, they drill to 13 holes, and on, on a pile similar to this size. So, you know, basically, we just want to make sure that you get good coverage on your stockpiles. Um, well, I mean, you got a pearl pile that came in, and Trey actually drilled for them 72 holes. Yeah. 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 But it was, I don't remember that one, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 In the end, you just want to make sure you get good, complete coverage. But we do get different numbers. Uh, it seems like. My, I guess my question is was there a reason for that, or did they just not really know how many holes? That, that our standard is typically 15 holes. That's what I was wondering. Well, I. I was going to say, I've never seen it written anywhere that it was 15 holes. We try not to go more than 75 feet between the holes. Right. Okay? Because at 75 feet, that's supposed to represent, that's a pretty good area. Right. So there would, I mean, given that, then uh, if you have a smaller pile, you'll have fewer than 15, but. Well, you could have 15, it'll represent 50 feet. That's right. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, we're never. I've never complained. And out of the seventy-two holes, I might complain about that. But uh, <laughs> well, yeah, you know. Right. Never really complained about getting too many holes. Um, but okay, the sample bags. Um, of course, same thing with the bags as far as with the map goes. We really need. And we've had this happen before, and I'm not going to mention any names or anything because everybody's probably been guilty of it every so often. We'll get bags that are incompletely labeled. And then a lot of times what we have to do is then try to go in and look at the map and lay all the bags out and kind of see maybe where one was missing on a hole or things like that. So it's really crucial. As good as you do on the map, you have to do equally well on the bags. Put the information on the bags. What, what plant? What plant you're drilling at, what pit it is, the whole number that, mat that corresponds to the number on the map, uh, the drill depth. Some of this repeats itself, but the map, uh, the map and the, the bags are like a good backup for each other. It's like a double check. Um, and this one is important more, not just for our guys here, but really for you guys too. Every once in a while, and I'm not going to pick on George, but, but I am a little bit. <laughs> It's okay to use, use extra bags. I know we're all trying to save some money and all that, but it's okay to use a couple of extra bags per hole and keep it 50 pounds or less as opposed to stuffing a bag full of material and it arrives here and it's 100, 120 pounds and we got guys out there trying to lift them up off the truck. The cost is so little right here. Well, that's what it is. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what you need is at least 30 pounds, right? At, yeah, now on the other side of that, is we need a minimum to do a full set of big bars we need a minimum of 30 pounds now I understand like in some scenarios if you're only a five-foot drill 
and you're using a small auger or whatever, but then in that case you may want to consider what you call double drilling. Uh, basically, if you don't give us 30 pounds of material for a sample, we can't extrude a full set of big bars. Well, the other side of that too, if it's a five-foot lift to drilling, you can get those big tractor augers. You know, you just hook that on the rig and get plenty of sample. But you know those skinny augers, you don't get much. Yeah. So some t it, it's important to get a minimum of, a minimum of 30 pounds per sample so that we can extrude a full set of bars. Um, but yeah, try to keep the bags uh, 50 pounds or less, even if you have to use multiple bags. Uh, that, that's more of a safety and a, don't want people to hurt their back type of issue. Um, right up, this is basically what we do. Based on the map and uh, the sample bags here at the lab, we put, uh, we put together a write up. This is one for Denver. Basically, it'll describe it. Um, it'll have the plant, what the title of here. This is Bijou Buff 1701 stockpile final drill 15 feet. Um, talks about the materials that will be used and the grinding instructions like right here. It talks about dry and grind the material to 10 mesh. Basically, we, we grind it as close to possible what the actual plant conditions are, except for the fact of when plants are, are heavy shale plants like Lynn's over there or maybe um, even BHP now. Uh, we have to grind those a little bit finer because if we don't, the mixing, you know, the mixing we have, you guys seen back there, it's a little Hobart mixer. It's not a JC Steel extruder pug mill deal. Um, the mixing doesn't do any breaking down of material. So with the hard shales, we have to kind of double grind it and grind it really fine so that we can get it to mix well so we can get a good extrusion. Um, and then on here is also extrusion instructions, number of bars, what the firing temperature is, which is basically whatever the firing temperature is of that, of that plant. Special testing, like right here it says, run soluble sulfates and leak out. Um, depending on what the material is, sometimes we have to do a special testing. Normally if it's just regular material, we'll just run a PSE. But uh, some like on the Elgin stuff that you guys are working on with the buff, we're going to be doing soluble sulfates on a lot of these because that, that's a concern. Um, yeah. Okay. The actual testing that we do after we get the write up that tells our guys what they're going to do with the material. Um, we do PSEs. Most of you know what those are. A lot of you do them. So that's a live action shot of our lab tech doing PSEs. Um, this is just a little chart from the Mike Vickers days. Kind of shows what the different size of particles are and what's called sand, silt, and clay. Um, most of the stuff up here we try to avoid, and you guys try to avoid <laughs> boulders. You know, we try to stay away from those. But this is just a little thing that just shows the different size of the particles of sand, silt, and clay. And the clay particles are the stuff that's just infinitely small. Um, there's our, I was talking about the mixing and extruding. Um, that's the next step. Uh, once they get the material is, is dr dried and ground, and it's in a bag like right there. Then they'll take it and they'll mix it and they'll put it in, you know, like ball form once it's mixed right. He'll get it, throw it up on the counter and they'll run it through our little extruder there, turn it into bars down there and our guy there is, is marking the bars. Uh, they also do a penetrometer. Most of you that have been in a plant or gone through the plant see, see them do that uh, up on the manufacturing line. We do that here as well. Um, it's not as critical for us. It's just more of a tool because we, we add water on a per batch sort of as needed basis. We don't, you know, at a plant you've got, um, uh, uh, most of it's automated now where you've got a certain percentage that you're running all the time and it goes up and down as, the, as it reads the moisture of the incoming material. Basically we start with stone dry material and based on whichever material it is they'll add uh, enough water to get it to extrude. But we're not so concerned that each one has the exact same amount of water. We're just more concerned about making it right so that after the bars are dried and fired that we have a good quality. But we still do a penetrometer as well. Um, water on extrusion is just a measure that you'll see on the data sheet. It's the, when the bar comes out, it's the, whoops, sorry about that. It's the wet weight, which is the bar when it's extruded, then after it's dried, and then you, wet weight minus dry weight over dry weight, that gives you the water on extrusion. Uh, loss on ignition is the next step. You take a dry bar and you have to wait for that. You weigh it after it's fired. That tells you how much you lost as far as weight goes when you fired it. Uh, and the total loss is from when you extruded it and it just came out to when you fired it. 
just the sum of the two. Um, with dried bars, um, which is halfway through the process, once we <coughs> extrude the bars and then dry them, we do an MOR on them. Um, we have the machine right back there as you guys are walking into the dungeon. This is an old school machine. You put it in there, it's like three point contact and basically it just comes down and pushes until the bar breaks and it gives you a reading for your dry strength. Or your MOR I should say. Your fired MOR, you do the exact same thing and the exact same machine after the bars are fired. Um, dry shrinkage, um, it, it's the same thing with the water on ignition. You start out Basically, if you see, if you, you guys have ever seen the little bars, they have little shrinkage marks on them. When we first extrude the bars, we put them in there, they're 100 millimeters apart. And basically you just, once it's dried, you measure it again. It'll measure to 94 point whatever. Well, it's, that's a quick way, since you start with 100, you'll know what your percentage is. But that's the actual formula for calculating it. Um, fired shrinkage, same thing except you just do it after you're fired and your total shrinkage is your drying shrinkage plus your fired shrinkage. Uh, then we do 24 hour absorption. Again, a lot of you guys that have been in and around a plant, you'll probably see a lot of them doing this, especially in the kiln area. Basically take a, in this case, bars. You, you know, you have, with the bars, one for our absorption, once you, the, the two fired bars that we run the tests on, they're broken, so they're in half pieces. So you take a half piece, you weigh it up, fired, then you put it in the water for 24 hours, take it out, weigh it up, and that's the formula. Basically, it's what it, what it is after it's been in the water for 24 hours, what it, what it was when you started, my, uh, over what it was when you started, and it gives you your percent absorption. Uh, then you'll also do the five hour boil. That's just a little picture of our really fancy high tech setup there, which is basically a big tub of water with brick in the bottom of it. You can kind of see it down there. There's some bars down there. And then our old fashioned stove with a metal pot with water in there that we boil it. Um, you basically, the five hour boil is the same thing. You take the water after the 24 hour, you take that bar, you put it in the water on the stove, turn the thing on. Once it gets to boiling, let it boil for five hours, turn it off, let it sit overnight, weigh it up the next day. Um, the C over B is whatever number you had for your 24 hour absorption divided by the number you have for your five hour boil absorption. That's like an ASTM test thing um, and it gives you a ratio <laughs> of your cold to boil. Um, the body color, that, some of these are kind of self explanatory now. So once, once we're done with all this, we grade the bars. We, we take a look at them for several things coming up here. One is color, that, that's kind of self explanatory. Um, here's the grading scheme. Okay, the, the five things that we talked about other than color um, scum, laminations, coring, fast dry, and lime pops. They're graded from zero to, from zero to six. A zero is the best, meaning in some cases like lime pops, meaning there would be none. Scum, meaning there would be none. So everything with a lower number is, a, is, a, is what you're looking for. Okay, scum, we saw some of that on the bars back there. Some of you guys that deal with plants, Bennett, Elgin, yeah, Sealy. Deal, deal with scum all the time. Um, we, we give that a grade. Um, I know that some of you will notice that our drying atmosphere, one, we mix a lot of things together. We have an old dryer. So we know that bars here tend to scum a little bit more than the ones that you'll run through at the plant. Um, but if we ever have an, a real issue with scumming or it's unexpected or things like the buff material that we're working with at Elgin, we can do soluble sulfates and other testing to more isolate the scumming. This is just more of a, a comparison thing, especially when you're doing raw materials. Okay, if you're expecting that that's the scum you want, and then next stockpile comes in and you get the same similar sort of thing, then you know you're, you know you're okay when it comes to scum. Um, laminations, we don't see much of this. I, I, this is an old picture. I can't recall the last time I graded any bar as anything but a zero for laminations. Um, Normally that's a problem with a, a body mix or a material. The thing is, a lot of the materials that might laminate for us, we actually won't be able to extrude. Because uh, if, the, if the material is too high in sand, our little baby extruder just won't, even though it pulls a vacuum, it just won't extrude it. So basically it's almost like if we're able to extrude it, it it's not going to be laminated. Um, coring, uh, for those plants especially that deal with carbon issues, um, this one's not so bad. I, I, I forgot I was wanting, I mean, I'm sure you guys have seen bloated bars and all that stuff like that. 
So, I mean, this one on our scale would probably be a one, just because it, it does have some carbon in there, but it really is very little and it hasn't had any effect on the actual dimensions. Um, the fast dry, we put that, there's a hot plate back there right next to where they do the extruding. They'll take a, a small bar right after they finish extruding all the bars, put it on the hot plate, come in the next day and grade it. It just basically gives you a quick measure of whether if you were to use this material by itself, that it would, if you have one that looks like this, that, that means you were probably going to have drying issues. But more than likely, the ones that you see that are like that are just raw materials, not body mixes. So if it's something that's super plastic like this and, and busts open like that, it's not going to be 100% of your mix. It's just going to be an ingredient in one, of your, in one of your body mixes or your only body mix if you're just a one mix plant. Um, lime pops, unfortunately, we've all dealt with those. Um, on our scale here, uh, the, the, the scale they come up with, I don't, I don't have the thing up here, but to get more than a one, it has to be really inundated with lime. So usually you're already going to see a zero or a one, like this right here would be a one, where if you, if you do see some small pops, and you know, we do have the acid that we drop it on there just to make sure that it's lime, because you know, we've all seen where sometimes you just get white rock or things like that. Um, but usually you're either a zero or a one on that because literally if it's a two or a three, it's enough to where the bars will fall apart. Um, there's a comment section where if something kind of off the wall happens, which that rarely happens, um, if you ever to go back into Geotech and see one of those, there would be a little field for where you could have a comment if you wanted to put something in there like that. Uh, then the data sheets, uh, if you guys have seen when you get bars at the plants, uh, we also include paperwork with that. The data sheet is basically just a sheet, simple spreadsheet that all the stuff that I just talked about, it shows all the numbers for whatever bars you, you've received, all the numbers on one sheet. There's one right there. So, I mean, there's, your, there's everything we just talked about from color, scum, laminations, core all the way across, your PSEs, all the way to your water losses, your MORs, your shrinkages, and then finally your absorptions. Any questions? Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> oh, oh, hold on. How's everybody doing? Hey, stretch. Okay, last segment. Hey! <laughs> so this should be the shortest one, right? Yeah. This is Geotech. It sucks. See you later. <laughs> All right. Uh, a word about this. Um, that was kind of a joke, but actually, yeah, Geotech does suck. Uh, if you don't use it very often, I use it all the time. All right. Oh, there you go, <laughs> Mr. Mr. Personality, right? You know, uh, I use it all the time, so it, it doesn't seem so bad to me. But if you only use it occasionally, it's terribly confusing. It's not self-explanatory. It seems like it's way harder than it needs to be to get your data out that you need. You need your data sheet, your holes, or whatever it is. Okay, well, what we're going to do right now is go over how you get to it. So from our intranet website, one of the ways to get to the web page that you interact with the database, which is what we're talking about, is the engineering and production services, that link on the left-hand side. Uh, next slide, or next page, excuse me. Production <coughs> services, click on that. At the bottom of the page. Yeah, right there, which is the bottom of the page when you get to that particular web page. Uh, Drilling and exploration, and I believe that is a direct link uh, to uh, to Geotech, which it's the landing page. Well, yeah, we'll get out, that you're going to start interacting with it now. Before you go, if you haven't been in there before, this is somewhat more of a technical explanation than it needs to be, but you have to have your credentials logged in properly in order for it to pass through for the uh, database to recognize what type of user you are. All right, so it, it, normally that should be invisible, and for a long time it was. 
But because Geotech exists on a really old server, it doesn't just work like it's supposed to. That's what the CR, C O R P, the backsplash and your backslash, excuse me, and your username, and then of course whatever your password is right this minute. That's what that's for. If you have problems with this step, call us and I'll help you out, and it'll be no big deal. But that's why it's there. It's because the our these two databases, the ASTM database and the Geotech database, exist on an old server, outdated server, really outdated server. Okay. So if you can get that done correctly, click OK. And of course, you can click down the thing there to remember your credentials so you don't have to do it every damn time. Uh, you'll go through to the next page, which is the landing page for Geotech. Now, um, this is all going to change. Okay? They are working on a new, more user friendly, better, uh, not so much the database, but an interact, this, this is how you enter, this is the web page you interact with Geotech with. Alright, so it's not so much that the database itself is busted, broken, or not all that great, it's the way we interact with it. This, that is outdated, that is not so easy to use. So we're, you know, down in Fort Worth, the IT department's working on that to get us a better system for working with the with Geotech, so it should be easier to use, better to use, get you your data, and so on. Here, though, if you want data sheets, for instance, you'd click up on the report for data sheet and then fill out the appropriate information. What that's doing is that's building an SQL query for your report and then it'll spit it out. Of course, there's also all sorts of problems associated with this, once again, because it's old. All right? The technology that was used to develop it over 14 years ago or better. Uh, is, is way out of date. And so it's cumbersome. It works with Java. Your Java has to be just right on your, com on your computer or it doesn't want to work right. And, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're fixing that. It's probably going to take the better part of this year, maybe even part of next, before it really gets fully done. But they're busy, you know, working on it to where it'll be a much easier thing to get your reports out, much easier uh, to get your data and, and what you're looking for. So at least we've got that. But if you have any issues with it, call me and let me know. If nothing else, I can get your report for you and send it to you as a PDF or in an Excel sheet or whatever it is that you're needing it. Okay. You can we can export out of this into Excel. It's just not as a, not straightforward. <laughs> it's one way to one way to put it. But yeah, it's just it's a really old system, unfortunately. And Unfortunately, also costs a lot of money to upgrade, so it was never done over the years because it was just it was a lot of lot of money, a lot of web pages you have to go through to make it make it work right, and so now it's gotten to the point where we're kind of you know any old day now it could just die. You know, uh, we won't lose data, but you would lose access because you know once again this web page is how or series of web pages is how you're getting your data out. It's how I put the data in, too. You could write SQL statements yourself. You can just go in and directly do it, but most can't. So there you go. But like I said, getting a new one, hopefully we'll have training on that pretty soon. Something nice, easy to use. You can get your stuff out. Everybody be happy. So that's what I've got. Any questions? Good job. Thank you. Yay. All right. Fantastic. Okay, guys. That pretty much concludes.